Guys, thank you so much. Don't go too far. Awesome. Well, it's nearly the end of day one of Summit. Summit days are like no other days. It's a bit like Malcolm. I saw Malcolm out there. Spring Harvest just used this venue a couple of weeks ago and kind of first time in here. And we bless you for the... That you know, for more than 30 years, Spring Harvest, way more than 30 years, Spring Harvest has had an extraordinary ministry in our nation, reaching generations of, of believers now. And uh, we thank God. Would you just put your hands together and thank God for the, the blessing that has been to the church in the UK? I think they started in a Pontins in North Wales, but over the years using many venues and and you know, as we gather here, I'm thinking of spring harvest days. They kind of get a whole week into about four and a half days, and it's a spring harvest week. Well, I think we're kind of doing that, because today feels like about a week to me, since we started at 11 o'clock. Maybe it's just me, but this is a summit day. And I often like to remind ourselves that we could be in many, many other places. But right now, I want you to just take a decision of, of your will, to press in. For the next little while, this is prime time. This is prime time. We have the opportunity to give him our time. And I hope you'll give me a bit of time. But in the midst of that, the most significant thing is that God would have our attention. And, 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 and that we would focus in on whatever he wants to not just say through me and through the songs and through our participation, but somehow that we would make some room make some room in our thinking, but most importantly in our spirits and our hearts for him to land something. Before we're done tonight, before we go into day two, summit day two of this uh, uh, leaders summit, I, I, I want us to do some business with God here. I really do. My, my heart is, is, is a simple message tonight. That one movement, one mission, we hope is not just a, a one year kind of hit on a title. In fact, Pastor Boyd and Pastor New, we, we, we want to borrow this one theme for a few more years. Like uh, often is the case, you guys were ahead of us out of the blocks. And some other uh, uh, conferences and events have been using the one theme, not just to gather for a moment, but to kind of look to leverage the body of Christ together to say, we are all about one Lord, one hope, one faith. Is anybody out there tonight? And one kingdom. So tonight, uh, we, we want to make uh, uh, some time for God to speak into that oneness message that he's speaking out to the wider body of Christ, the wider church. Uh, but So for us, it's more than a conference title or a simple aspiration. It's an expression of a deep and shared conviction that Elim, such as we are as a tribe, as a family, a growing global family of followers of Jesus is called to a future of intentional and more intensive mission. Now, in a way, that's like every other family of church out there. Every other part of the body of Christ is called to the same thing. We're called to live for Christ fully, to be His wherever we are in every community and place. We're called to worship him and to make him known. We're called to edification, to build each other up. We're called to exhortation, aren't we? To make the, the word of God known and share it and preach it and communicate it and show and tell the good news of Jesus. We're also called to evangelism. Where, where's Gary and Mark? Just I expected a cheer there, guys. We're called to share the good news of Jesus. And, and, and most of all, to do that with our lives. So we share that with the whole body of Christ. But there's something that we can do to kind of leverage that familiness, that likeness, that shared story, that shared experience over more than 100 years or so of the Elim uh, movement in the UK and around the world. And, and we want to make maximum, uh, uh, certainly, use of that opportunity tonight. On the road over the past year, we've been going around uh, uh, into various regions of, of the UK and Ireland and, and, and having some conversations about vision for the next few years, Vision 2020. And again, like some of your churches already trying to engage in how we can move forward together. That's not just a Malvern Elim head office thing, but it comes from the conversations that we've been having that we sense 
that our times are increasingly urgent, that the culture shift, the seismic plates are shifting in our wider society and culture. We heard Leon talk a little bit about that in first session today, and Glenn in the second session, talking about how that is beginning to impact all of us. And yet we would declare that the church has been here before. That in times past, the Christian church in other seasons has been in similar significant culture shift moments, seasons, kairos moments. So as we've been talking, we've been saying, surely it's not just about another year or few years for Elim with business as usual. And from yourselves and from our leaders and churches, we sense that there is a, a, a real stirring for Elim to fully commit to moving ahead and to advancing in all that God has for us a movement. One movement on one mission, the shared mission of making Jesus known to the ends of the earth. Did anybody say amen tonight? There's fresh momentum. What I love to call from Acts 11, evidence of the grace of God out there in churches and communities. A number of us are based at Melbourne, we, are, we get the privilege of coming out to churches every, other, every weekend somewhere different in Elim world. And it really is a privilege because we get to see up close your journey, something of what God is forming in communities and large cities and, 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 and small rural areas where, where there are some believers that kind of identify with us who are along with other streams. Great to have the guys from Assemblies of God here. Guys, we're in this together. There's something that God wants to awaken in us, some of us historic Pentecostal movements that gets us moving again. So I want to say it's not just aspiration tonight. I want you somehow to try and engrave that on your heart that for these next years we will pray, labor, work, encourage, collaborate. I love that from this morning, the, the collaborative work that the Holy Spirit is doing so that we will do our bit to advance Elim. Can we say that? Now, I, when I say that, that's laced with kingdom for me. But you know, we get to influence more significantly that part of it that we identify with, that we're a part of. Family and tribe that we are already a part of. So, just very simply, let me just say something about how we're beginning to uh, change the direction of travel for Elim together over these uh, last weeks and months, some of these things have come together in what we're calling our four missional priorities. So as I talk tonight about one Lord, about one gospel, one life, I want to root it in something. Let's go to the scriptures for a moment as I just jump off some verses from Paul in the book of Romans chapter one. Paul writes, this amazing epistle to the Roman church. We'll come to that in a moment, but just the verses first. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness. By his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we've received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Do you know, as we're going to begin to unpack some of those verses and a little bit later on in the chapter in a moment or two, but let me just say for a moment that as we have gathered since last summit around four words that I shared with summit at the close last year, we've seen that there's a resonance about them. The words are disciples, leaders, churches, and nations. I think that the last three of those four are, are pretty obvious for any Christian denomination, any Christian movement, that when we talk together about our joined up life, our joined up calling, our joined up purpose, many local churches, many expressions of what Jesus is wanting to do in local communities and neighborhoods, 
where you are. When we talk together, we're all about raising leaders that are going to be whole and alive to God of, of every uh, part of the spectrum of, of age and, and, and race and, and, and culture and background, men and women and, and, and from near and from far who will not just sign up to church but will give themselves unreservedly to Jesus and to his advance. We want to raise leaders, don't we, that can engage with culture with joy and, and, and with a sense of fearlessness to be creative in the way they live out their gifting and calling before God. But we want to be involved intentionally in that. We want to be involved in churches that grow and are full of life, are places that are not just attractive for an hour or so on a Sunday, but are embedded in community, are doing life with people, are good news in the town and the city and in the nation. We want to be all about nations. What a great summit to say that in this place that we've gathered. 102 Elim Global Leaders for this summit. For the very first time, why don't you just put your hands together and appreciate them. We'll have some moments where we do that and you can see them and meet them. I want to say it's a humbling moment to get some people from around the globe that we some of those we've known about for a long time, but some we're discovering each other and finding that we've got a bigger Elim family than we knew. And actually right now, how many of you know that's the church of Jesus Christ around the world? From sunrise to sunset today, the church of Jesus Christ has been meeting, gathering, working, serving in all kinds of communities. Some of them in the cathedrals that are, are fashioned historically as, as centers of worship. Many of them in, in purpose-built church buildings and, and, and some of them in, in, in hired halls. Increasing numbers in every city and town in the UK. There are people renting out buildings, community halls, schools, and the church is meeting. But you know as well as I, and I've said this in some of your churches, in some places tonight the church is meeting for fear of a knock at the door. In a, a kind of an underground situation where, 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 where they are not prescribed, not allowed to do what they're doing, but the church is still alive and well and flourishing. I want to say whatever shape or style or, or, or context the church around the world is, the church of Jesus Christ is advancing. It's advancing. It's advancing. It's growing exponentially. Only the Spirit of God can truly count. And we're part of that. But there's one word in there, nations, churches, leaders, that is a little bit more difficult for me to grapple with. It's the simplest of all. It's the word disciples. And I just want to say, because it should be so obvious, but I want to say that we are making a commitment over these next few years to lean into these together, to join our story, to, to touch base with your experience on the ground and to try and gain some greater momentum and some fresh movement into our culture and society and communities for Jesus' sake. Let me just say a few things that are my, not just aspirations, but now faith-filled visions for Elim on that journey. I pray that Elim will become a discipling movement. For every leader to become a disciple maker. Every church to become a disciple focused and shaped community. I, I like to call it a greenhouse of grace. How many of you have greenhouses? Okay, there we go, the, the green fingers in the room. Do you know what that, what that structure does is gives you a, a, a special piece of ground, a special space where you can intensify growth. It's hotter, warmer. It's a microclimate. Wouldn't it be amazing if every single church community that we are a part of becomes a microculture of grace? Where if they're with you, they're going to grow. They're going to grow not according to the textbook, but they're going to grow according to the accelerated plans of the Holy Spirit. Some of you are, are on that journey already. You've been experimenting with that greenhouse grace growth. That takes some saying. The end of a busy day. And you've seen that discipleship is not just a course. Discipleship is not just a, a program. It's become a pathway. 
You're starting with what are we trying to produce and working backwards rather than cluttering the journey with all kinds of programs and policies. I would love to see Elim explode with something of an adventure into discipleship where converts flourish and grow into disciples who grow into disciple makers. Some of you are saying, we're there. We're already on that journey. Some of us are saying, good on you, keep going, but share with us your journey. What are you finding? How are you intensifying that growth? What are you doing to unlock the, the maturity that's already in your church that don't have a sense of what the next part of the journey looks like for them? I want to tell you, we're going to need to find some disciples in these next years. I'm going to say it again. We're going to need to find some disciples. They're in your church. They're in your church. People who will give themselves to maturing others. Years ago, I went into our church in Cardiff. It was a very well-known historic church in Elim. You know, that the magazines have been written and the books have been written about what that bunch of people accomplished over decades to reach a city. In fact, out of that church, more than 40 Elim churches were planted. They had a plan. Every, every year, a few would get established all over the UK, not just in Wales. And a generation of people not only came to services together, that's what I used to think. But then I got there and I got to know them and I got under the skin of the church. And I found out that, yeah, back in the day, they were busy six nights a week in meetings, but they weren't only doing that. They recruited they identified, gathered, trained, and equipped a workforce of disciples. I found it by accident. As we were saying a farewell in terms of ministry to some volunteers that were leaving a, an evangelistic kids ministry that we had. One couple that are probably in the room tonight. They were a young couple just going out in some church planting with us. And... Uh, they said to me, you know, the, the one thing we really feel a bit guilty about is we're giving up the kids' ministry. So how long have you been doing that? They said, 15 years. They were about 30 at the time. And I got the story. I teased it out of them. How did that happen? Well, if you were a young person in the church, you didn't only come to the services. You don't only go to youth. They got you involved in things. And I began to hear names of people in that church one was a man called Brennis Thomas. He was never a, 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 a platform person. He was not somebody that would have been on the, the kind of elders list of, as you, you know, came into the, the membership meeting. But Brennis was somebody that just looked out for people, that he could disciple. There was a guy called Ted Morgan. He was another wild Pentecostal plumber. There, there was one once from Bradford called Smith Wigglesworth, a wild man. This was another one. He was Welsh. And he was completely bow-legged. I don't know why I'm telling you that, but it just came out of my mouth. And Ted Morgan, on the night my mum and dad were married, he was arrested by the police because they thought he burgled somebody's house. He hadn't. He had his alibi was he was at the wedding. I don't know why I'm telling you that either. But here's what he would do. He had faith for every single believer, everybody to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And while nobody was looking, Ted Morgan would grab a young person and pray for them. And they would receive the Holy Spirit. And they'd be singing in tongues and speaking in tongues and prophesying as soon as Ted got his hands on them. What I'm talking about is there are people in our church, let me say it like it is, people will not be fulfilled until we release them to do the real work of discipleship. Pastor of the largest church of the smallest. You can't get enough jobs for people to do that will fulfill the yearnings of their heart to serve him. You can't just do it through positions and alignment in this ministry and that. Somehow we need a revolution of discipleship where we are going to release ordinary folks like you and me to get involved. I was with a, a, a very significant leader uh, recently who, who, who's not leading a church but has just moved church. And in the conversation, when we were talking about this, he said, I think I could do that. I was shocked. I said, what do you mean? He said, I think my wife and I could disciple somebody like you're just talking about. I said, wow, I've never thought that, that you would say that, because I'm kind of, 
I'm kind of struggling with what does this look like? And what he was saying was, there is an ache in my heart. I've just gone to a new church. I don't know many people. I think we could disciple some people. I said, what's stopping you? And I think I'm waiting to be asked. I said, what if the pastor's not seeing it? What if the leader's not going to ask you? Then what are you going to do? We began to tease out what it might be for us to think afresh. Guys, when you go home, I'm going to ask you tonight, will you pray for God to show you who are the potential disciples in your current church, your current community, whether there are five of you or 500? Willow Creek some years ago did a huge study on the, the, the commitment levels of their church. It's called the Reveal Study. It's out there. And what they found was the people that were on the journey to faith Loved the church, really passionate about it. The people that were new converts, just been saved about a year, following Jesus about a year, made a commitment to him. They were pretty switched on and excited. People who had been there about five years or so, still pretty there, but less and less. Really fulfilled, satisfied. The people that had been there over the years, been to the courses, signed up for this, eaten the cake and worn the t-shirt, were about to check out of the church. They began to do some tough work. They said, facts are your friends, but what do we do with that information? They began to do some work under the skin of the church. They found that their church community, there were so many people. They'd been feeding them so much, but they never really helped them to become self-feeders and to help others to be fed. I am crying out that we would go on a discipleship adventure where we'd learn how to do this for the rest of our days until Jesus comes. And we release more and more and more that do whole life, 24-7, 365 days of the year, discipleship. And I believe that some of you are already stumbling, intentionally or unintentionally, into some real revelation on that. you got some stories Watched some of Gabriel from KT. I watched some of your programs recently. We were talking about it, bro. And as you were talking, you got the guys in at the end. Some great teaching on TBN. But at the end, he gets the guys around the table. And it suddenly is applied. Because the guys are talking about life. And as I watched it, bro, keep going. Keep doing it, you guys. There's something that came alive there. So I'm praying that we become a discipling movement. I'm praying that Elam would become a movement that produces and reproduces surrendered and spirit-empowered leaders. That's what we're going to be responding to a little bit tonight. It's not just great leadership stuff, but will we let him lead us somewhere fresh, somewhere out of the ordinary? Will we let, us lead, will we let him lead us from this season into the next with fresh hope, dare to hope, Leon said to us. It wasn't just for those that are new recruits. A movement committed to developing healthy and reproductive leadership culture that makes healthy and fully committed leaders. I thank God for a diverse, a growing, diverse men, women, all age, all ethnicities and cultures breed of servant leaders that are coming through in Elim. It seems to me it's Acts 2 and it's Joel 2. That he would call people, break down every barrier, and he would begin to call men, women, young, old, Jew, Gentile, this culture, that one. And I thank God for the greenhouse grace of the nations that's upon Elim. Not just around the world, but in our towns and cities. As I go out there, you, you know this, some of you. 10, 15 years ago, we'd have expected international church communities in London, maybe in Birmingham and Manchester and a little bit in some other cities. Now it's open our eyes. It's everywhere. Go to a church in a little town. I was in the Potteries and, 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 and 16 nationalities in the church that, that night. Some Iranian guys that had just come to faith, bursting with joy and zeal for Jesus. Your church, the nations are coming. Your community, your town. I want to suggest to you that there's an opportunity for us there to hothouse, to greenhouse that and begin to more intentionally see, Lord, how can we do this from now on? 
It's just a couple more and we're going to go into the scriptures and I'm going to fly through what I have for you. For Eden to be a movement committed to planting and growing healthy reproductive churches. Committed to growing churches that grow. That's not back on the church growth statistical stuff of a a previous decade, but just saying, Lord, we want to grow. We want to grow up before we grow old. We want to go deep as well as high. We want to stretch out, not for our name, but for your name. How many of you know the church in our nation needs to grow? Needs to grow strong and healthy. The small churches and medium churches and rural and city and metro churches. God wants to grow his family. Well, for however long we have the buildings, buildings are a great help, but they're not it. And so your churches, you know what the church is? It's people, not buildings. It's relationships, not religion. It's universal, not just local. In the midst of all that, we know this stuff. I am just so excited that God's stirring that in us again. And nations, for Elim to be a movement that is global, not just in its prayer and its encouragement of others, but committed to mission and ministry to all peoples and all nations. A number of years ago in Cardiff, we got to know some young Eritrean guys and gals about 2007. And we discovered that not only had something gone on in their nation where all the churches in 2004 had been closed by the authorities and every pastor and elder and was kind of arrested and, and thrown into prison. Many of them years later have traveled out in the most harrowing experiences and have come to our towns and our cities. We began to meet them and many of them were, were in our church as fellow believers, disciples, Pentecostal Christians up before the authorities and we, we went through the journey of do, do we speak on their behalf when we're just getting to know them? Do we, do we support them and, and, and fellowship? How do we do this? And in the midst of that, again, it was a grace thing as God began to speak to us very, very particularly about his tenderness towards nations that have come to us. I think one of the greatest revelations about what's been happening in the British church with hindsight will prove to be that God has brought all the nations of the world into our cities and towns and our communities. And he's doing it for a kingdom purpose. Now I'm biased because I started ministry as some of you in the room did in, in, in London where the nations were there, but it's no longer just there. They're everywhere in our nation. So nations there and nations here. Let me just go into the substance of my message, and I'm going to be fast with this. We get to the book of Romans, and it's the most extraordinary book. Paul, writing to the disciples of the church in Rome, urges them to live with an awareness that they're in a kairos moment. They're in a time like no other. They're in a time where the gospel has now reached the center of power and of influence of the greatest civilization that the world had ever known until that point in time. And he's writing. He hasn't been there yet. We read Acts, uh, the last few chapters and he's there, isn't he? He arrives. But at the moment, he still wants to be there. In fact, he, he can't help spilling that out. He says, I, I long to be with you so that I may impart something to you. I want to get something into you guys, but until I come, he begins to write. He begins to write with amazing passion, some of the deepest theology in the New Testament, but also some of the, the purest praise that comes out. And here he is writing to a church that's scattered in the city to wake them up. They call them to step up, rise up, and fulfill their destiny. One church historian said, uh, and I heard this quoted years ago when I was in training, that the early church didn't begin on a welcoming stage, but rather entered into a hostile arena of competing faiths. First century church, not a stage, but a hostile arena. It makes me think of the gladiators. It makes me think of the Colosseum and 
And Paul's writing to Rome where they're in the arena. But he's not just calling them to be embedded in that arena, but to stand up and rise up in the arena of Rome, of an empire that's sold out to other gods. So it's the arena of Rome, and he writes to this emergent Roman church, this embedded Roman church, an extraordinary story that the gospel has reached there. It's made it right to the center, center of political power, military might, of learning, democracy, of spirituality. Rome had gathered all the gods. You can visit the city today and in the Pantheon, that shrine to a a time when Rome gathered all the gods and and stamped everybody else's God and, and then made Caesar God in the center of it all. And in that context, the Christian message and mission was now in Rome. And here it would come into sharp conflict with the presiding culture. I want to suggest to you, I think we're back in Rome. I think we're back in that kind of culture. I think we're back in a shifting changing culture that seeks to preside and rule and seeks to invite us in if we would submit to all the relativism and join in with the other gods. The letter to Romans has been hugely influential, wasn't it? This that was being preached when Wesley's heart was strangely warmed. Wasn't it this that changed the life of Martin Luther as he began as a reformer to find the revelation of God's heart, his pursuing love and justification by faith in the, and, and, and in faith alone. Wasn't it this book that captivated the great preacher, the great doctor of Westminster, Lloyd-Jones, who published volume after volume of his preaching journey through Romans. But it's a very real book. It's not just a shelf theology. It's a living faith that Paul shares in Romans. And so to this immersed church, he asked them, how should you live in such a place and at such a time? And his response is not to run, evade the culture, avoid the challenge, but to stand and to swim against the tide and to live for Christ there, here, right now. And in Rome, he's clear about the gospel. And to Rome, he's clear about it. He's clear about their identity in Jesus. And he's clear about their part in the greater plan. It's a defining moment. I want to come to three things that come out in various ways of the many. Of this one message to one historic church in the center of an empire But more significantly, I want to suggest to you that back in the arena, these are challenges to us. The first one is a confession, and it's built around this amazing statement that I've already read in the first verses. There's a confession that comes out right at the beginning that says, Jesus Christ is Lord. Writing to Rome with all their competing lords. Now, in the New Testament, the, 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 the word Lord is the title is used over 600 times. 300 of them or more are from Paul. It's a title that is an everyday term in, 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 in their world and their culture. So in many ways, it's just the word for sir or master. It's conversational, it's respectful, but not necessarily to be immediately of great help to the forming church in the nations, fulfilling the commission of Christ. But when we get to Romans 1, Paul begins to do something and others begin to do something as they gather around this word. They begin to speak of Jesus as Lord. After the resurrection, as they pronounce him as Lord, this word seems to become the creed the rule, the basic declaration of their faith in Jesus. And here in Romans 1.4, Paul doesn't just use it descriptively. 
he uses it as a, a term of relationship. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Where Caesar is called Lord, Paul makes it clear that Jesus is our Lord. Not them, not him, not that, not this. Jesus is our Lord. Do you think it might be time for the church in our nation to say, Jesus is our Lord? Of all the competing claims for lordship in our lives, for ownership, rulership, allegiance, worship, Jesus is our Lord unashamedly. It's more than a personal declaration. Remember Thomas? After the resurrection, he wasn't there on one of the appearances. And, and, and when he is, he said to his, his friends, he said, unless I see for myself. In fact, it goes further. It's very real. Real people in real places. He says, unless I put my hand in his hands, I will not believe. Wow. Then you know the story. Jesus appears. John tells us what happens in that moment. And Jesus Shows him his hands. There's a moment when Thomas encounters the risen Lord. What does he say? My Lord and my God. Now I know that the Gospels are shorthand, breathed in by the Holy Spirit. I know that, 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 that the Holy Spirit's all over that, but he doesn't tell us what else. All the details, I want to know. What did he do? Did he touch his hands? It seems not. The moment he identifies, you are my Lord and my God. I want to suggest that between the lines, he worships him. That moment when he says, my Lord. Have you said, my Lord? Sure you have. There been times in your life as mine where that revelation that he's not just the Lord, but he's my Lord. We've sung it over the years, haven't we? The great old song that we, we, we may well do again tonight in a moment, just of simpleness and surrender. When we say, you are Lord, you're my Lord. And, and, and mostly I've taken that as a step further, but this is a step further on than that. This is not Paul saying, you are my Lord. This is not just Thomas saying, you are my Lord. This is the church saying, you are our Lord. Guys, I believe that there's something in that unity we serve one Lord. This is not just about personal revelation or personal vision or personal calling. Great as that is, freeing and liberating as that is, we are called to serve one Lord together. And what would it be for us to begin to live out that shared expression of his lordship over us and not just over me? I wonder what that would do to some of our egos and agendas as the Lord begins to maybe steer us together in some new ways. Leon suggested earlier on that there's greater power, pulling power for horses together than running on their own. So here's Paul beginning to say there is one Lord. Jesus, our Lord, is Lord in Rome. The rest of the New Testament, how many times does he talk about the Lord? The confession, Jesus is Lord, Philippians 2. The belief in the resurrection and confession of Jesus is, is essential to becoming a follower of Christ, Romans 10. Only through the Holy Spirit and in him can a person say that Jesus is Lord. Paul says, I don't preach myself, but Jesus as Lord. Personal transformation and collective vision and purpose so he writes to Romans Christians in Rome that have arrived there from all over and he calls them to one confession one Lord against the climate of the day shared worship and shared obedience and in Rome and from Rome only a church united in him would be able to accomplish all that he had for them to do I think in the Gospels, the disciples have followed him as master, but not necessarily surrendered to him as Lord. And then we read in Luke 24, that after they've seen the cross, 
after they'd been on the mountain with him hearing the Sermon on the Mount, after they'd been in the boat and seen the miracles, he's still having to open their hearts and minds so they would really get it. It says he opened their minds so that they would understand all the scriptures about him. And they begin to live with Jesus as their Lord. More than master, but the one that demands and is worthy, deserves absolute worship, total surrender. What does this mean for you and me to respond to him afresh as our Lord? I think it means that it's not about our ministry, but it's all about his. I remember Wimber years ago, the leader of the vineyard movement back in the day that had such a, an impact on the British church. And back in the uh, 80s particularly, and the Baptists and the Anglicans and our own streams. And he used to talk, he used to joke, he said people would come and ask him to come preach at the conference and the, He'd say, you don't want me to come. And they'd say, no, we really do. You were our first pick. And he said, no, you don't want me to come. Not really. They said, no, we really want you to come. It's like the things they say to Dave Campbell when they can't get him. No, really. You know, you're our number one pick. He's on tomorrow night, guys. He's got a great message for tomorrow night. And they said, we really want you. And he said, no, not really. You don't want me. You want him to come. Oh, I remember hearing that as a young guy wanting to give my life to Jesus running back to him saying you can have it all and I was a mess and just saying oh Lord I kind of know that that I have a tendency to make it about me and mine and we have a tendency to make it about our ministry I want to say when we, when we serve him as our Lord when we serve him together as Lord it's no longer about your ministry or mine it's all about what does it take for him to be glorified What does it take for us to lay that down? That doesn't mean he won't use you. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. More than we can ask or imagine. There's something in our future about laying down ours and picking up his. And there's something in doing it together. There's an extraordinary thing that that Paul says at, at one stage in Romans. He talks about outdoing one another in how we honor one another. So the same spirit that says it's not about my ministry looks to celebrate what God is doing in my brother and in my sister. What could that look like to cultivate a movement where it's not just faint and fake praise, but we genuinely look to honour what is happening in one another, in your church, not just mine. And we look to celebrate the shared calling. Our Lord. This is a quick one, the conviction of one gospel. I know Dave's going to take this further tomorrow, but I just want to refer you. Later on in Romans 1, Paul says, not only is it Jesus Christ our Lord, but there is this good news gospel message that we are called to carry in Rome and from Rome and wherever we are. That they are living in an eternal drama was his belief an adventure of eternal significance. It drives him not only personally to live for Christ and to share him, tell others, but to stir everyone. So here's what he says. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and also to the Greek. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. He's totally convinced and convicted by this gospel. From our own experience, the gospel gospel can so often be a subjective thing, me, my story, my life. But Paul seems to be driven by and compelled by this sense that we have a story together, a better story, yes like Glenn was sharing with us earlier on, to rediscover the gospel. Last year at Summit, I said, I I think God is calling us to a glorious obsession with the gospel. And as I look back in Elim World Past, uh, our forebears seem to have a deep desire to get the gospel and get it into one another. 
They came up with a basic formula, didn't they? The four square gospel. What was it about? It, I think it was a, a memory aid. But so much more than that, these four pillars of what Jesus did and full salvation, that Jesus was the Savior. The world in need of a Savior needs reintroducing to the Savior of the world who loved us so much that he died to pursue us without exception. Whosoever will that may come. And this challenges our preferences and prejudices as we've heard already today. Anyone, anytime, any condition, the pursuing love and the lover of our souls, the Savior reaches out to them and to us. And I think for us to update that shorthand, Jesus as Savior, we need to fill ourselves with stories of what it looks like when real people surrender to Jesus. Such was Paul, an enemy of Christ, who never let himself move from this absolute blow his mind understanding that he, a rebel, a jihadi of his day, a hater of Christ, became his bond slave because Jesus pursued him. They called Jesus healer, our forebears. Not just the savior of the soul, but the healer of the body, bringing physical, emotional, and spiritual healing to those that reach out to him. The new normal for those Pentecostals was that Jesus hadn't finished healing bodies and setting people free from life-controlling stuff. The new normal became people who were naturally supernatural. I know they look funny in the pictures, but they went out and about praying for the sick and believing, not just in a good explanation of why some are not, but giving God an opportunity to break in with miraculous power. And I don't know about you, but I'm saying, Lord, lead us back into that faith, that simple shorthand faith that cannot just make him known from afar, but up close in our streets and our communities. You can see us beginning to pray for the sick again, beginning to believe for total freedom again. I watched a short video by the guys at Teen Challenge just the other day and just tears moving down my cheek is not just because I, I, I was listening to Jay and to, to Phil Hills, that, that, that'll do it sometimes, but that wasn't that. But tears of joy, guys, as we just heard some stories of life-changing encounters with Jesus. They called him baptizer in the Spirit, that the gift of the Holy Spirit was for every believer. And their obsession with the gospel wasn't just about a crafted sermon, but people like Ted Morgan that would get you in the youth group that would get you in church, get you in the back, and just encourage you to receive the fullness of all that the Holy Spirit had for your life. And some of you are here because of people like that. And they had this other bit to their understanding of the gospel that they soaked in and until they were pickled by it, until they just couldn't help themselves but be stained by it. They believed that Jesus who had come and was risen and is alive, was coming again. It doesn't get a lot of response in our churches, that one. We've been distracted. We've been kind of conformed to some other ways, but they lived with not a, this is the interpretation of the beast and the 666, but they lived with an urgency and they looked for the signposts of the times Whatever you think about their preaching on the second coming, I tell you, they lived with an urgency. How's the church going to recover its urgency? I have a feeling that in easy times, we don't do good. I want to come to the final part of my message tonight. There was a confession that Jesus is our Lord. There's a conviction of the gospel that, that pulsed through Paul's veins. But there comes in the book of Romans again and again a consecration. A consecration that is in Philippians 2 and Galatians 2 and it's in Ephesians. It, it drips from him. Everything changed for Paul on a moment on the Damascus road when at the height of his hatred... 
the zenith of his zeal to wipe out Jesus. Jesus pursued him and changed him. For the rest of his life, he would live with that sense of being totally given over to Christ. His time, his energy, his life ambition, everything was for Christ. Paul is clear, following Jesus is not a leisure choice. It's not an ideological position. It's not a career choice. It's not a moral or ethical discipline. It's a whole life utterly surrendered to him. Galatians 2, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ in me. Philippians 3, verse 8, I consider everything lost. Some of you know, refuse. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Having given up his old life and his old self and his rights. and It's clear that he's not yet perfect. But he's the richer for this Jesus. This one thing I do, Philippians 3. Forgetting what is behind. I press on towards the goal. For the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The call goes out not just once in a lifetime. In, in one moment of surrender. And many of us have had those first encounter but in the real life situations that you and I are in right now and in seasons to come the call goes out again of Jesus for a surrendered people it's not only a call to be willing to die for him but it's a consecration one life one Lord our Lord one gospel that we share for the world for all people everywhere. But one life that you and I have to live. 40 years ago in the summer of 1978, the conference of Elim met in Clacton. Anybody there? It was a wave. Remember those heady days of Clacton and Bogner and Minehead and It seemed like a, just an, an ordinary year. Another conference came and went. In mid-June, my dad, who was working at Cheltenham in our offices, was the uh, editor of the Elim Evangel, a weekly publication then, that told Elim News to Elim World. And he wrote his last editorial as the editor. And a new editor was just about to take over the issue and so my dad's final edition as editor was about to be published on June 24th. It was already printed in advance, Saturday, June 24th. On the 23rd of June, a Friday, as many of you know, tragedy struck the Elam Mission Station in far off Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. And 13 of our missionaries were brutally massacred at the Eagle School. Many of you know the story well. Some of you were at the Bible College graduation the next day. Some of you were in the offices. I know John Smith and Mary are here at the conference. And John was right in the midst, bro, right in the midst of that tragedy with the team. David Ayling Sr. and, and Leslie Wigglesworth that, 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 were, that were on uh, immediate call. And our team at Cheltenham began to respond to being in the spotlight of the world's press. Suddenly that spotlight shone on Elim and the world's press and media. Lionel was pastoring the Cheltenham church. And that Sunday, uh, I remember it well, as the, the, the nation was there in the service watching. The following week saw the Elim family seek to respond and tell the story of tragedy and triumph. Faith in the face of the greatest onslaught. Tomorrow night on this stage... At 9.45, we have a, it's about a 45-minute drama presentation of that story, written by and performed by Richard Hasnip, who leads our performing arts track. Please try and be here. It is extraordinary, that power of that presentation. This would happen not remotely to others, but to us, to our missionaries. They'd given their lives in serving Jesus. They'd stayed knowing the danger because they loved the people and they loved 
Jesus' love for the people. They were extraordinarily ordinary and recognizable heroes of the faith. Paul writes to the Philippians, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, I will not be ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honoured in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He goes on to urge them not just to die a death worthy of Jesus, but to live a life worthy of him. I want to say the emphasis here is not just on the dying well, but living well. In the light of that, Paul says, I want to live every moment. I want to squeeze out of every moment. Total surrender to Jesus. Do everything that he has for me to do. I'm torn, he says. So we recognize that those who live for Christ also have one life to give, if necessary. It's happening now around the world. Visit the persecuted church stall over in the exhibition center. They'll tell you more about how you can pray and know what others are facing right now. Two weeks later in the Elam Evangel, the new editor, Raymond Hunston, writes this. Surely when we are confronted out of the apathetic service of Jesus Christ and out of the indifference and the many petty things that so easily hold our lives... From this one event, the greatest memorial Elim can raise is the living monument of young men and women dedicated to the service of Christ, of older church members called to a new dedication of ministers and church leaders everywhere, seeking as never before to promote the gospel of Jesus in our own land and across the world. There was a sense of awakening in Elim afterwards that we'd never be the same as a movement that that example of giving everything to Christ would be something that was more than well-intentioned charity, humanitarian outreach, like them that we would take up that very cause of bringing the kingdom of God to the ends of the, the earth. Brenda Griffiths, who was back in the UK with her husband Peter, who'd led the team that were so brutally killed said we can take courage in the faithfulness of God to the world the Elim massacre was a foolish waste to loved ones an intense grief to those who died a future beyond compare but in God's purposes on earth a planting and a harvest I sense the Lord calling Elim in this season and time calling us to renew our consecration that the direction of travel from now on will only be one way, which is forward, advancing the kingdom together. The worship team would come back, moving in obedience, learning how to pull together in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. But move we must. Move we must in our lives and in our allegiance. Move we must for the sake of those around us. Move we must because of the pursuing purpose of Jesus who isn't done with us yet. The yearnings of your heart and mind will not be satisfied with business as usual, but with surrendering to the more, the greenhouse grace that he wants to develop in and out of our lives. We're going to sing a simple song and I I don't want to manipulate tonight. I, I don't think that I need to right now. But I want to ask you and me in the room how we live from now, how we give ourselves to our Lord will determine the outcome of families and of communities, of towns and of cities, of nations and of generations. There are leaders in the room that we've invited to come speak into us over these days. And I want to stir you that this is, this is 
for every one of us. I want to encourage you that what you're carrying right now in your hearts and your lives as you seek to impart to others, we also want to impart to you some strength, some faith for the next part of the journey. And call out of you tonight in, in loving partnership a moment of response where we all put it aside, badges, titles, and duties, responsibilities, and we say, it's all about one Lord. It's all about Him. I resign everything else. And I sign up to Jesus again. That promises Him that we will adventure with His gospel till we rediscover it so we can't keep it in. And that calls us to a new surrender of giving our lives again, again, just very simply to Him. Would you stand? Let's just allow a moment or two of response to sing the song. I'm going to ask you to sing it. He is Lord.